Hello, in this tutorial I'm going to show you how I personally go about making um, battle maps on GIMP um, for use with virtual tabletops um, and actually for printing and playing as well. Um, so this video I'm just going to go over some of the very first steps um, including uh, image creation, um, laying out your drawing, and, and, and putting down some of your um, very first bits of, of line work. Um, so the first thing I'm going to do is, um, I'm going to assume anyways that you know how to download and install GIMP and open it. So um, assuming you're sticking with me so far, you go to File and New to create a new image. It's going to ask you to designate a width and a height in pixels. Um, you can choose inches, millimeters, points, uh, so on and so forth. I always stick with pixels because you'll notice with, with Roll20, with Fantasy Grounds, with the other virtual tabletops, um, they have recommended... Um, resolutions um, for pixels per square, uh, pixels per five foot square to be particular. Um, and Roll20, uh, I've seen the number 70 thrown around and I've also seen, um, especially when, when looking at their um, creating marketplace assets page, they recommend a resolution of 140 by 140 pixels. So I saw that way back when I started making maps and I stuck with that resolution um, since then. Um, Sticking to one standardized resolution for all of your map creation um, helps you uh, enormously down the road, especially when you start creating assets. Um, and when you're choosing brush sizes and stuff, if you're using the same scale all the time, it becomes second nature to say, okay, hey, all my line work is eight pixels wide. Um, all of my more minor line work is six pixels, so on and so forth, whatever you want. I find it's easier um, for an artist especially if they're going to make things and they want consistent quality to to keep it the same um, so 140 is what i chose you can do 70 um, the only drawback to that is you have a bit less quality per square um, but it allows you to create bigger maps overall because um, gimp photoshop all of these photo um, manipulation programs all bog down once you get past a certain resolution size in terms of images especially once you start dealing with a lot of layers um, so if you're dealing with 70 pixels um, per square, you're effectively doubling your capability for map size. So that is one big plus to using 70. I personally just went with the 140. I find um, I can still create reasonably large maps at that 140 resolution, and I really enjoy having a higher level of detail and crisper line work. Um, so anyways, that's what I chose. So um, knowing that, um, when I go to create a new layer, um, all of my widths and heights are always going to be multiples of 140. So to make a map that is 20 squares by 20 squares, uh, that's going to yield or, or um, that's going to um, require a width of 2800 and a height of 2800. So um, if you're going to be printing this image or if you think you're ever going to be printing this image and you want that image to print exactly to scale so that each square that is printed on your map is one inch, I would recommend you go to advanced options and designate that your X and Y resolutions are going to be your 140 or whatever your resolution you're choosing per square. Uh, you'll see here pixels per inch. So now what happens is if you set your image up like this, you finish drawing your image, you export it to whatever file format you want, a PNG or a JPEG. Um, you take that image to a print shop and you get it printed exactly to 100% scale. That, that um, print is going to have perfect one inch squares um, drawn right on the map and that's going to fit perfectly for your mini miniatures so it's quite an attractive idea for those that print and play locally um, I unfortunately don't have that opportunity so I've stuck with digital but I've never I've never restricted myself in any way I've always left my maps um, be available for print if I ever chose to do so down the road and and making making these settings um, reflect your image resolution for every square uh, it doesn't harm your digital image in any way shape or form these resolutions do not change a single thing if your product is just going to be digital so you don't have to worry about these if you know for sure you're never going to print it but you never really know for sure you're never going to print it so why not change it now and, and then you know that if you ever decide to print it down the road, you can do so, and it's to scale. The rest of them, these settings, I just leave default. They're good enough. I hit OK. 
what you start off with is just a white background layer. That's perfect so that when you throw your lines down, you have a nice contrasting black line work to white background. If you didn't have this white background layer, you'd be left with a transparent layer, which it's a bit harder to distinguish line work on the checkerboard here. So anyways, we turn that back on. Uh, if you don't know how GIMP works, um, these are where all of your layers are displayed. As you create new layers, you'll get a big um, long list of them that you can scroll through. Eventually a scroll bar will appear here. Um, to turn on and off just the visibility of the layer, you just click this eyeball button. Um, real simple. And as you're making maps and creating more and more layers, you're going to make use of this visibility toggle quite a bit. Okay, moving on. So I've renamed my layer into white. Um, it just helps me kind of recognize things. So the, the first thing I'm going to want to do is create a grid layer. Um, so I would go to layer and new layer. You'll see here, if anything has a keyboard shortcut, it'll show it right beside it. Um, to me, as many things as I can do with keyboard shortcuts, the better. Um, so when I create a new layer, I don't go layer, new layer. I actually hit control shift N. Um, as you'll see right here, and it opens up the new layer dialog. All of these settings, every single one of these, can be edited after the fact, so it's not super important what you pick here. Um, to me, the only thing I usually do when I create new layer is give it a name, um, purely because it's already got my mouse cursor selected there, so it saves me a couple of clicks down the road. So I'm going to name this layer grid. You can give it a color tag if you want. That basically, um, it splashes a color down here around the eyeball of the layer. Um, when you're dealing with uh, you know, dozens of layers, sometimes it's easy to pick out layer types um, based on color rather than just what you've named it. Um, so it's a handy trick for down the road. Um, anyways, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to create this grid layer. At the moment, all it's going to do is create a big transparent square that's sitting on top of the big white square. Um, so we want to add a grid to that, and GIMP has a great tool for just drawing a grid for you, and it's just a few clicks of a button. It's highly customizable, so what I do is go Filters, Render, Pattern, and Grid. It opens up this dialog that allows you to edit some grid settings. And because I chose a resolution of 140 by 140, I'm just going to go ahead and change the width and the height of that. Um, it's going to automatically change that to 142 because there's a little chain link here, and if you can see, the chain link is intact. If you wanted to change these individually, you would remove that chain link, and then you can edit that. But to me, having a square grid, you don't ever want them to be different numbers, right? So um, you keep that chain in intact. Um, I find with the resolution that I work in, having a line width for my grid at 3 pixels instead of the default 4, um, typically looks a bit better for me, and then I just hit OK. It leaves you with a, a grid that um, it's exactly to scale. These are going to be each 140 pixels. Uh, if you count them, that's going to be 20 by 20. Um, it, it's, 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 it's a good grid, but I find the black is a bit harsh, especially once I'm going to be drawing on top of it. It's going to be hard to distinguish what I'm drawing with the grid behind it. So I take my grid layer and I lower my opacity of it down to about half, maybe a bit below that. Um, that leaves me with a bit of a gray in the back. Um, so I can still, when I'm laying out my my basic, you know, my cave, my building, my castle, whatever I'm drawing, um, when I'm laying all of that out, I can right off the hop use this, this grid to um, mentally keep track of how big I'm drawing my buildings, how big I'm drawing my trees. I'm not going to make a tree that is only, you know, two feet by two feet. I'm not going to make a tree that is also 30 feet by 30 feet either, unless I specifically want to make a tree that big. Um, I find having a grid in the background while working helps you keep a frame of reference for every single object and, and every single layout decision you make. Um, so that being said, you've got now your white background layer, you've got your grid layer that is mostly transparent except for the grid lines itself. Um, you go to create a new layer. I call this one just layout or sketch whatever you want to call it. The great thing about layers, like I said, is you can always edit them. I hit OK. That's going to sit on top of my grid layer. Its opacity is going to default back up to 100%. So you know that when you use the um, black brush tool, it's going to create crisp black lines. Now for my layout, these are the settings I use for my brush. Um, I choose a hardness of, of, of 75 rather than 100. This would be the 100. I use the 75 because I like having that faded edge that you can see here. Um, if I zoom right in, you can see what I mean here. You can see how it transitions from black to 
white in a bit of a smoother fashion than with the the hundred hardness. To me, it's a bit more pleasing to the eye to have that bit of a fade. It adds a bit more of a kind of a smoother transition. Um, but to each their own, you can absolutely use whatever settings you want here. I'm just showing you the way I do it. So I've hit Control Z twice to undo both those line strokes. I've switched back to my hardness of 75. My my brush size, I use 10 pixels for my what my doing my layouts. Um, I'm zooming out now so I can see the entire map. And now I'm just going to spend the next few minutes um, just really roughly laying down a general idea for my cave. Um, so I'll go on regular speed for the first little bit of this, but then I'll speed up for the, for the remainder of it um, so you don't have to listen to me talk the entire time. So I'm going to just kind of add some lines here. That would be my kind of entrance hall sort of tunnel thing. Um, actually, that's a bit too small. So one of the things that I like about this grid is you can always kind of see, okay, well, this corridor has to be sort of roughly five feet for my players to easily walk through. So you don't want to make it too tight of a squeeze for them, um, especially if you're using this map on roll 20. It's going to look awkward to have their tokens kind of bleeding out the edges um, too much. So keep that in mind even when you're doing a rough layout and things will go smoother uh, down the road. So then I want a kind of a big entrance chamber. So I'm going to kind of make it like this. And you don't have to have, you can draw lines all over the place. It can be like really rough. You can just do doodles. Um, it doesn't have to be pretty at all because this layout layer, you're going to delete it by the time you're actually finished this map. It's, you're just, this like the grid layer is kind of a basis that you're using um, when you're drawing layers at, on top of them later on. So um, here we go. And at the end here, I might uh, I might decide that at a later point I might actually want to make a a hidden little tunnel that the players may not pick up on right away, but it might uh, gain them access or exit really quickly from like the front of the dungeon to the end of the dungeon. Um, you know, it's something I can do later on. It's something I can completely ignore later on. Um, but I've got it now on paper. It's an idea. I can choose to ignore it later on if I want to, and I can choose to adopt it later on. Now that I've got my layer or my layout down pat, I'm going to go ahead and turn that opacity down a bit so it's not fully visible either. Um, and I'm going to create a new layer on top of that and call it lines dash wall. Um, when I'm when I'm um, creating my maps, I deal often with dozens of layers, and I find if I manage my layers. Um, as I create them rather than having to go in and, and rename everything and shuffle things around after the fact, I find it's easier for me down the road. So when I'm making layers that I know are going to be explicitly for line work, I always start the name of the layer with lines. I add a dash and then I describe what that layer is going to be a line drawing of. So I'm going to be drawing the walls of this cave system. So I hit lines, walls, OK. Make sure that's my active layer and it's sitting on top of layout. And now this is the point in time when I will go in and I will draw um, better, slightly squigglier lines that look a bit more like a, a natural cave texture. Uh, and I basically I'm going to draw roughly over my layout lines. And you'll notice I'm just letting my, my hand wander away from those lines as much as I want. Um, it provides a more natural look and um, even, even with the time that I spent on the layout layer, the shapes that I drew for the rooms look awfully like circles, and I don't think many caves form that way. Um, not that we're going for 100% accuracy here, but it's it's nice to have a step in that direction. So um, I, I I let my my mouse or my drawing pen wander a bit um, to bit give it a bit more realism, um, and I find it looks just aesthetically pleasing this way too. So again, I'm just following these these rough um, background lines um, that I drew on my layout layer as I as I uh, put down the actual line work for my for my walls layer. So I'm going to speed the video up from here because you don't need to hear me uh, continue to talk for the next few minutes.
one thing you'll notice I'm doing is um, as I'm moving along the canvas, I'm not having to put my mouse over here on the scroll bar. Um, all I'm doing is simply to, to pan across the image uh, as I'm drawing without having to zoom out, zoom in, or use these scroll bars is I press and hold the space bar and then drag my mouse across the page. Um, the space bar is just a, a shortcut um, for the pan tool. It allows you to pan across the map and I find especially at this stage of the map drawing um, it is a godsend. My finger is constantly on that space bar um, moving along the image so that I'm maintaining um, the same level of zoom um, but easily navigating uh, to make this as painless as possible. Okay, so I've, I've, I've thrown down the, um, the finer detailed line work for my walls um, and you can see kind of the final result once I disable my layout layer uh, by clicking this eye toggle here. Um, it's actually looking pretty snazzy and it definitely looks a lot better than my initial layout was. Um, that's, that's the beauty kind of, of, of throwing that layout layer down first is it kind of gives you a, a rough guideline and it makes um, drawing the actual cave lines a lot easier because the, the larger decisions of where to put a hallway and where to put a room have already been made for you. So all you're doing is um, focusing on making the cave walls look a bit more natural. Um, and it takes like hardly any additional time to do that. So, Okay, that concludes part one of this tutorial series. I don't know how many parts the series will end up being, um, but I plan on adding color, shading, texture, some smaller features like pebbles and stones. Um, anything else that pops to mind uh, as I go along and complete this map um, from start to finish and I'm going to be narrating my thoughts and my process uh, as I go. Um, I apologize part one was kind of basic in nature but uh, I do feel it's necessary to lay down the proper groundwork and set yourself up properly so that um, the rest of your map making experience is as smooth and painless as possible. Um, so thank you for watching. Um, if you want to, click subscribe. I plan on be, uh, making follow-up videos to this. Um, I hope this one is informative and I hope my future ones um, you'll find just as useful. So happy uh, map making.